Episode one of Behind the Line, I am your host, KC. Follow me on Twitter at KC underscore BTL84. Before we get into everything, since it's episode one of the podcast, I wanted to give you a little bit of a breakdown of what I'm going to do on the show. This is going to be an NFL, NBA, college football, college basketball. That's going to be the primary focus of this podcast. I'll touch a little bit on the UFC. I'll try to get to Major League Baseball here and there. Maybe when October comes around and the playoffs are going on, I'll try to squeeze in a little bit of Major League Baseball for the people that watch it. But for the most part, this is going to be centered around college and pro football and basketball. I plan on uploading every Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday. On Fridays, I'm going to give you my college football bets of the weekend. I'll pick three to five games that I like and and give you who I'm taking. Saturday is going to be an NFL-centric podcast. I plan on uploading on Saturday mornings. I'm going to give you the NFL games that I'm taking on Sunday. Normally, I take between five and seven NFL games every Sunday. And Tuesday, we'll kind of recap the weekend, check our progress of how our bets went, and go over a little bit of news and look forward to the weekend ahead. I've got a lot to go over with you guys today. Obviously, we've got football season starting this weekend. We got a whole lot going on in NFL training camps. The, the Dallas Cowboys have contract situations going on with Dak and Zeke. We got Andrew Luck shocking the football world last weekend by abruptly retiring from the NFL. I'll give you my college football picks at the end of the show. And I want to touch a little bit on the NBA. I know it's the offseason, but got some a little bit of stuff going on out in Los Angeles with the Lakers that I wanted to touch on today. But let's go ahead and get into to college football. If you're anything like me, then you've been waiting since February for football season to start. I always get excited once the NFL preseason starts about football season coming up. It's my favorite time of year. I love fall weather. Football is my favorite sport. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. I was looking at the slate of games that we've got on this week one schedule for the opening weekend of the season. And I'm disappointed. I don't think I've seen a more pathetic slate of opening weekend games in my lifetime. I was looking for for three games to bet this weekend. And I'm looking at the top 25 schedule because, let's be honest, that's all anybody cares about is the top 25 teams in the nation. Everything else is just noise. And so I'm looking at this schedule, and I noticed that we've only got one game this weekend that features two teams ranked in the top 25 in the preseason polls. That's Auburn and Oregon. Obviously, it's going to be the game of the week. The, the networks really have no other choice because everything else is shit. I mean, you got Alabama playing Duke, Ohio State playing Florida Atlantic, Michigan playing Middle Tennessee State. I mean, I could go on and on with the list of shitty games that we're being offered this weekend. I'm used to the opening weekend of college football season being exciting. Last year, we had eight teams in the top 25 play each other. The same in 2016. 2017, we had six teams in the top 25 play each other. This year, we're getting two. One game. One big game the opening weekend of the season. Now, normally, week two of the college football season is, is when the, the, the competitive balance in the schedule drops off. We're getting that in week one this year. And one of the reasons this, this disappoints me is because I thought the 2018 college football season was boring. I, I thought it was boring. I thought it was anticlimactic. The, the playoffs at the end of the year were boring. They were blowouts. Some of your conference championships were blowouts. The, the regular season, it just didn't have a lot of excitement in it. There weren't a lot of memorable games. I can't remember one game last year in college football that I watched and, and really excited me. And that hasn't been the case in years past. And to me, this speaks to a bigger problem in college football. It just seems like the past couple of years, there's been a lack of competitive balance, especially with your top teams. The NFL is designed for every team to be 8-8 eight and eight at the end of the year. That's how they design it. From the draft to free agency to how they structure the salary cap. 
It's designed for on paper, every team should be 500 at the end of the season. Now, I understand that we'll never get that kind of competitive balance with college football. You're always going to have your Alabamas, your Oklahomas, Michigan. You're always going to have your top-tier programs lure in the majority of your five-star recruits. A team like Vanderbilt is never going to compete for a national championship. You could pick bottom-tier teams in the Pac-12 and the ACC and say the same thing about them. It's just the way it is. For, for 100 years, you've had your traditional powerhouses in college football. What I don't understand is why they don't play each other more often. I got to looking at the schedules for the four playoff teams from last year. Oklahoma, Alabama, Clemson, and Notre Dame. I got to looking at their schedules for this year. And I've got to be honest with you. I don't have a lot of high hopes for the 2019 college football season. Oklahoma plays two games against teams ranked in the top 25 in 2019. Now, obviously, this is based off of preseason polls. That can change. But as of right now, they've got two games scheduled against teams ranked in the top 25. Alabama's got three. Clemson's got two. Notre Dame's got three. The Notre Dame thing kind of surprised me. Notre Dame normally, they set their own schedule. They're an independent program. Normally, they play higher quality opponents. I don't know if maybe, you know, they set these fucking schedules so far in advance. It's hard to know when you're when you're scheduling a game four years from now who's going to be good and who's going to be bad. I mean, Notre Dame last year had six games against ranked opponents and six of their games ended in 10 points or less. A lot of close games. Notre Dame is very entertaining to watch because a lot of their games come down to the fourth quarter. Much like the NFL. You can't say that for Alabama, where last year they had one game decided by 10 points or less. That was the SEC championship against Georgia. Clemson had two. What I don't understand about college football is, is why can't more teams be like Notre Dame? Why can't more teams schedule out all 12 games? Get rid of the conferences. To me, the conferences drag college football down. And I understand you. there's a lot of traditionalists out there that are tied to the way college football is done. I understand there's a lot of conference rivalries. You've got Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama and Auburn, uh, Alabama, LSU, Auburn, Georgia. We could go on and on about the tradition with the conference system. But to me, the conference system drags the NCAA down because 70 to 80 percent of the 12 game schedule is filled with bullshit games. Why does Alabama or Auburn need to be playing Vanderbilt? Why does Ohio State need to be playing Minnesota? When is the last time Minnesota has been relevant in the national championship picture? Not in my lifetime. So to me, the conference system drags it down. Get rid of the conferences. To me, it would be a whole lot more exciting if you took the top 50 teams in the preseason poll, put them in two separate conferences, and divided them down by division. Put five teams in a division. You got 10 divisions overall. And have the big-name programs play each other head-to-head -head throughout the year. Now, you might say, well, the preseason poll, you can't really do it based off of that because the preseason poll is inaccurate. I mean, it's done before the season, before anybody plays a snap. But surprisingly, the preseason poll is extremely accurate. I went back five years to 2014-2015 to check and see how many of the four playoff teams were ranked in the top 25 in the preseason poll. Mainly what I was looking for is the top 10. So 2014-2015, all four teams were ranked in the top five in the preseason poll. 2015-2016, all teams were ranked in the top 25. Only two were ranked uh, in the top 10. Had a little bit of a down year that year. 16-17, all four teams were ranked in the top 20. Three of the four teams were ranked in the top 10. 17 and 18, three of the four teams were ranked in the top 10. All four of them were ranked in the top 15. And then last year, all four of the college football playoff teams were ranked in the top 12. 
So the preseason poll was accurate. Another thing this would accomplish is having teams left out of the playoff picture every year. It never fails when it was the BCS or now when it's the college football playoff. You have a program every year that feels like they were left out by some committee of their opportunity to play for a national championship. Every year it happens. Mainly because all your top teams play such soft-ass schedules that they're either undefeated or they have one loss come the end of the year. This, what I'm talking about would eliminate all that because if you had the top teams playing each other, most of your teams are going to have at least one loss. What you would do is you would take your division winners, they would automatically qualify for the playoff, have you a handful of wild card teams based off of record, you could put in other tiebreakers here and there, and then everything is fair. Everything is based off of merit. The college football would be a whole lot more competitive and, and you would get rid of teams being left out. Well, then you might say, well, what do you do with the other teams? Well, let them play in a, in a division or conference of their own like you separate D2 teams from D1. The same with the bowl games. That, that would be the real kicker is the bowl games. There's so much money tied up into bowl games that if you went to a system like what I'm talking about, it would get rid of the majority of that. But from a fan's perspective... I don't give a shit about the bowl games. 95% of the bowl games to me are unwatchable. I don't care about watching Baylor play New Mexico in the tire bowl. The only bowl games I care about are when the college football playoffs start. That's it. That's the only postseason games I care about in college football. Now, I understand if you have a team that you're tied to it's exciting, you know, when they make a bowl. I don't understand that. I, I don't understand how a 6-6 six and six team can make it into the quote-unquote college football postseason and be playing in a bowl game. There's so many bowl games now that it's rendered most of them meaningless. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. It's, to me, it's a sad state of affairs when the Division II system has a better playoff format than the Division I system does in college football. You know, that's just something I was thinking of this week when I was looking at this shitty-ass slate of games uh, week one, thinking about how boring college football was last season. Do I think it'll ever happen? No, that will never happen. Because your top programs, number one, don't want it to happen. They're making too much money, going undefeated every year, playing nobodies. I don't understand. If, if I'm a college football season ticket holder, I feel ripped off at the end of the year because you're really paying all this money to maybe see one exciting home game maybe I remember last year I believe Alabama was playing some cupcake ass bullshit ass team it was the 11 o'clock game on ESPN and uh, the ESPN reporter goes to interview Nick Saban at halftime and he goes off on a tangent about the attendance mainly focused on the student section. The student section was fucking empty. It was empty. Wasn't an ass in a seat. I believe Alabama was up something like 42 to nothing. Uh, the game was being played in late September. It was hot as fuck in Tuscaloosa. And Nick Saban is railing on the students for not supporting the football team. Well, my thought was, why don't you give them a reason to come? I don't care how die hard of a Saints fan I am. I would not pay for season tickets if I knew seven out of eight home games were going to be blowouts. I wouldn't pay the thousands of dollars a year to go watch that. It's, it's not worth it. It's the same in college football. Why would anybody pay all that money to go watch your team blow somebody out? It's just not entertaining. So that's my thoughts on week one of the college football season going into it. I'll give you my three games that I picked to bet this weekend here a little bit later. But first, I want to talk about the NFL. Andrew Luck shocked the world last weekend when he retired. And there's been a lot said about this. I, I want to get to Doug Gottlieb in a second, but I want to get to my initial reaction at first. I, like everybody else, was shocked by it. I know that the fans in Indianapolis are catching a lot of flack for booing him when he was walking off the field. I understand where they were coming from. 
obviously they didn't know the context of why he was retiring at the point at, at that moment. They they probably just felt like they got slapped in the face and the the face of their franchise for the past seven years just walking out on them. Well, then you watch that press conference, and and you you see the pain on Andrew Luck's face when he's talking to the press. He really choked up when he got to talking about his family. And the main reason for his retirement was he spent the last four years going through hell. I mean, he's been hurt on and off since 2015, mostly on. And Doug Gottlieb came out on Saturday and he tweeted the most ridiculous thing that I've seen anybody speak about Andrew Luck's retirement. He says, retiring because rehabbing is too hard is the most millennial thing ever. And this really, this really fucking touched a nerve with me because I'm a millennial. I get sick and tired of generations that are ahead of us talking shit about us like we're lazy. Or in this case, uh, him and him and insinuating that Andrew Luck isn't tough. I mean, you can go study after studies that show that millennials are more entrepreneurial than any other generation beforehand. I saw a stat the other day where it said 51% of millennials either own a business or they plan to start a business. So this notion that millennials are lazy is bullshit. Or, in Andrew Luck's case from Insinuated by Duck Gottlieb, not tough is bullshit. If anything, millennials don't put up with shit. We do what we, do what we want, which is what Andrew Luck is doing. Now think about it from Andrew Luck's perspective. The rash of injuries that he's had to deal with the past four or five years. It all started back in 2015. He sprained his shoulder. November 2015, he lacerated a kidney, partially torn abdominal muscle. January 2016, he tore cartilage in his shoulder. November 2016, a concussion. January 2017, he had shoulder surgery. Missed the entire 2017 season. Came back last year. Was the NFL Comeback Player of the Year. And then this offseason, he has a calf strain. And he's got problems with his leg. I read an interesting article by Jeff Schwartz on SB Nation. I didn't know who Jeff Schwartz was. I'm betting most of you don't either. He's a retired NFL lineman. And he's, he's talking about the Andrew Luck retirement from a player's perspective. And the, the, the crux of the article is about how tough it is to overcome an injury, especially during the offseason, going through the rehab. He talks about how the offseason is critical not only to heal physically, but more importantly to heal mentally. And, and most of the article talks about how tough it is when you're going through rehab in the offseason. You really never get a mental break from the game of football. Andrew Luck hasn't had a mental break from the game of football since 2015. No wonder he's burnt out. You would be too. So would I. If you worked at your job right now 365 days a year for the past five years, never having a day off, would you not be burnt out on it? I would. So for people like Doug Gottlieb coming out and criticizing the guy for being weak, talking about, oh, retiring because rehabbing is tough as a millennial thing to do, Doug Gottlieb ain't never played a fucking down in the NFL. Not one. So I don't know what he knows about going through rehab to get back into the game. Now, do I think Andrew Luck is really done with football? No. I think he'll be back. I know you see a lot of guys retiring younger and younger in the NFL. Gronk retired after the Patriots won the Super Bowl last year. He's, he's another one that has just been beat to hell and back is pretty much his whole career. But I think Andrew Luck will be back. I, really, I blame a lot of him retiring on the Indianapolis Colts. They never really put an offensive line around him. His first two years in the league, he led the league in sacks. He's been sacked something like 174 times in, his, in the six years that he's played. He's, he sat out that one season injured. But I think Andrew Luck will be back. I think if he's, once he sits out a year and recollects himself, 
I think the competitive nature in him will want to come back and try to win the Super Bowl. You know, Gronk's a little bit different. Gronk's already won multiple Super Bowls. Andrew Luck hasn't. So I think he'll be back eventually. You know, the, the, the game of football is hard to walk away from. You hear retired players talk about it a lot. The, the rush of playing in front of 72, 75,000 people, um, the camaraderie in the locker room, it's a hard thing to walk away from, especially when you've been playing it since you were six, seven, eight years old. It's, it's all you know. I hope Andrew Luck comes back. He was one of my favorite players in the league to watch, a classy guy. Only time will tell. Let's segue here into the Dallas Cowboys. Jerry Jones, it wouldn't be August in the NFL without drama going on with the Dallas Cowboys. We've got Dak, Zeke, both wanting contract extensions, and and both deservedly so. Neither one of them gotten it yet. Uh, Obviously, Zeke is holding out a training camp. He's off somewhere in Cabo, San Lucas, or in the Caribbean. Ah, who, Who the fuck knows where he's at? Dak is in camp, and he plans to play this season. But I want to talk about Ezekiel Elliott before I get into the Dak Prescott situation. Ezekiel Elliott is critical, in my opinion, to the success of the Dallas Cowboys. To me, if you take Zeke off that team, then Dak Prescott is not even in the conversation for a contract extension right now. As far as running backs go in the NFL, I think Zeke might be more important to his team than any other running back in the league. And he wants to be fairly compensated. I mean, let's be honest. Everybody knows running backs in the NFL do not have a long shelf life. Zeke's 24 years old. This is probably his only chance at making big money in his career. Right now, Zeke is the 10th highest paid running back in the NFL. You got guys like LaShawn McCoy making more money than Ezekiel Elliott. Hell, the Buffalo Bills a couple of weeks ago were talking about possibly letting LaShawn McCoy go. He's past his prime. Zeke Elliott is in his prime. And the Cowboys have ran him into the ground since he's been there. Last season, Ezekiel Elliott ran the ball 304 times. Led the NFL by 43 attempts. His rookie season, he ran it 322. 2017, he only ran it 242. But you got to remember, he was suspended for four games. Actually, he was suspended for six games that year. And if you don't think he looks at a guy like DeMarco Murray, who was his predecessor in Dallas, then you're out of your fucking mind. DeMarco Murray was in a similar situation that Ezekiel Elliott's in right now. He was the Dallas Cowboys workhorse, playing behind Tony Romo. Led him to the playoffs that year in 2014. Of course they lost. That's what Dallas does in the playoffs. In the 2014 season, DeMarco Murray ran the ball 392 times. In the offseason, he wanted an extension from Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones lets him walk. He's never the same player he was in that 2014 breakout season. DeMarco Murray's been out of the league since last year. And that's what guys like Zeke Elliott look at. Zeke Elliott's 24. DeMarco Murray was out of the league at 29. His prime was over, you could argue, at 26, 27. Obviously, Jerry Jones wants Zeke to play out this year like he does Zach, uh, Dak. But when you're a running back, you really can't risk that. You know, Dak Prescott could get hurt this year. He could hurt his ACL, you know, or his shoulder. He could come back next season and, and, and be the same guy. Ezekiel Elliott gets hurt this year, he's done. He's fucking done. He's not getting a dime from the Dallas Cowboys. I saw a report today that Ezekiel Elliott plans to hold out through the regular season if he doesn't get his extension. And I hear all this stuff about Tony Pollard. Oh, he's having a great preseason. Oh, he could be the Cowboys running back of the future. The fucking kid is unproven. A lot of guys have great preseasons. The NFL is littered with guys that have a great preseason end up cut. I went back and looked because I'll be perfectly fucking honest with you. I had never heard of Tony Pollard until this preseason. 
Kid went to Memphis, and over the course of his career at Memphis, he had 139 rushing attempts. 130, that's not one fucking season, that is in three years. So this kid was unproven in college. And you want to put your hopes on him being able to replace Ezekiel Elliott? Go ahead. It wouldn't surprise me. It would be a it would be a Jerry Jones thing to do. He tried that shit with Emmett Smith in the 90s. How'd that work out for him? What'd they start that year? One and two, one and three, I don't remember. Until he had to go groveling to Emmett Smith to carry them fucking back to the Super Bowl. It'll be interesting to see how it works out this year if Zeke actually does hold out. Because the Dallas, the Dallas Cowboys have a relatively easy schedule as in terms of NFL standards. Looking through their first four games, they open up at home against the rebuilding Giants. They go on the road to Washington, at home against Miami, on the road against the Saints. They should be favored in every game except that road game against New Orleans. If the Cowboys start out 3-1, and one, it'll be interesting to see what Zeke does if he actually decides to come back. They start out one and three, you know what's going to happen. Let's get to Dak Prescott for a second. I saw a report a couple of weeks ago that Dak Prescott wanted $40 million a year from the Dallas Cowboys. I about lost my fucking mind. $40 million a year for a Dak Prescott. I don't think Dak Prescott's worth $25 million a year. Now, granted, he's worth more than the seven hundred thousand he's going to make in twenty nineteen, but forty million dollars a year for a middle of the road quarterback? Now I can hear the Dallas Cowboy fans now. Oh, but he's been thirty two and sixteen. He led us to our first playoff victory since the Troy Aikman era. He's our savior. To me, the NFL at the quarterback level, you've got three or four tiers of quarterbacks in the NFL. You got your elite guys. Guys that you put on a team and they're automatically in the playoff hunt. Your Tom Brady's, your Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers. Maybe maybe throw in a Big Ben in there. And then under that, you've got your great quarterbacks. Your Russell Wilsons, your Phillip Rivers. Guys like that. Maybe a Matt Ryan. And underneath that, you have your middle-of-the-road, I'll call it, NFL quarterbacks. That's where Dak Prescott is to me. I was looking at the Pro Football Focus uh, QB rankings when I heard that Dak Prescott wanted $40 million fucking dollars a year. And I was just curious where they ranked Dak Prescott. According to Pro Football Focus, Dak Prescott is the 17th best quarterback in the NFL. Sounds about right. What's crazy is, is guys like Kirk Cousins and Matthew fucking Stafford are ranked ahead of Dak Prescott. Now, if you ask the Minnesota Vikings or the Detroit Lions whether or not they regret giving major fucking money to Kirk Cousins or Matthew Stafford, I bet a few people in that organization would say yes. I don't think that Dak Prescott has reached his full potential in the NFL. Do I think he's got the ability to be a great quarterback? Yes. Do I think he'll ever be a Tom Brady or a Drew Brees? No. And to me, that's the guys that should be making $40 million a year. I don't care how fucking old Tom Brady is. He's worth it. Dak Prescott is not. Now, $25 million a year, $30 million a year, I, I, to me, I think even $30 million is overpaying for him. Because like I said earlier, if you take Ezekiel Elliott off that team and have Dak Prescott carry the Dallas Cowboys, I don't think he can do it. I don't think he can do it. Even with Amari Cooper, I don't think he can do it. So it'll be interesting to see what Jerry Jones and company decide to do about Dak and Zeke in the, in the coming week, week and a half. Let's go ahead and get to the college football bets of the week. Um, I got three games this weekend. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm a whole lot better betting the NFL than I am betting college football. Now, I'm not bad at betting college football. I'm just, I'm more in tune with the NFL. I'll pay a whole lot more attention to it. 
Uh, and, and to be honest, September is the hardest time to bet, either, either college or the NFL, but especially college. We haven't seen these teams. College football rosters have a lot of turnover year over year. There's a reason that sports books have never had a losing month in the month of September. Now, they've had losing months in October and November and December, but a Nevada sports book has never had a losing September. This is why. You know, people get excited to bet football. It's finally back in. And let's be honest, the sports book know these teams a whole lot better than we do. But let's get right into it. First game I looked at, obviously, was the game of the week I talked about earlier, Auburn and Oregon. Current line is Auburn minus three and a half. It opened up earlier this year, back in July, at Auburn minus two and a half. Oregon went nine and four last season, and they got a true NFL quality quarterback and Justin Abair under center. A lot of people were surprised that he came back this season. A lot of people thought he was going to be drafted, me included. One of the things that kind of concerns me about Oregon, they only covered five games in 2018. The defense was improved over 2017, should be improved again this year. They got all four of their DBs coming back. Auburn last year, eight and five. It was a disappointing season for Auburn. A lot of people had a lot of high expectations coming in. The offense was fucking atrocious last year. I don't see it getting much better this season. They're starting a freshman at quarterback in Bo Nix. The defense should be stout again this year. The Auburn defense, in my opinion, was one of the better defenses in the SEC last season. But once again, they're going to need their running game to carry the offensive load, at least early in the season, until Bo Nix kind of gets his feet under him. Fortunately for Auburn, they got one of the best running back tandems in the SEC with Jatarvius Whitlow and Cam Martin. Nix is also a dual threat at quarterback, so he can help out in the running game as well. But to me, this line seems kind of backwards. I really expected Oregon to be the favorite here. Now, I know that a lot of people think that SEC teams are, are, are better than all the other conferences, and to some extent, that could be true. But one of the things I look at when I bet college football is teams with NFL quality quarterbacks getting points. And that's what we have here. You know, Auburn obviously is going to have the edge defensively. But a lot of people thought that that Justin Abair could have been a top five pick in last year's draft. I know an SEC defense is a huge step up from a Pac-12 defense. But like I said, I'll generally lean toward the NFL quality quarterback over a stout SEC defense in college football. I'm going to take Oregon plus the points. Next game up, Northwestern and Stanford. Line open, Stanford minus six and a half. Currently sits at Stanford minus six. Huge question mark coming in at quarterback for Northwestern as head coach Pat Fitzgerald has yet to name a starter. Uh, the battle right now is between five-star Clemson transfer Hunter Johnson and redshirt senior TJ Green. Crazy thing is, is they've only got 64 collegiate pass attempts combined between them. Now, I'm reading reports, and a lot of people are leaning toward Hunter Johnson getting the nod at starting quarterback, so that's what I'm going to assume going into this game. Pat Fitzgerald has said that he doesn't expect to, to make a decision until they release the, the starting lineups on Saturday. Now, the Northwestern defense was dominant in 2018, and it looks to be dominant again in 2019. Uh, they returned eight starters, including five on the front seven, uh, they got one of the best linebackers in the country in Patty Fisher, who is a potential first-rounder in next year's draft. Now, I'll, Stanford's got the more proven quarterback with K.J. Costello. He's returning from last season. Dude had a big year last year, threw for over 3,500 yards, 65% completion percentage. However, I think that Stanford is going to have a tough go of it, mainly early in the season. The running game at Stanford really struggled last year. They really depended on the arm of Costello to lead them. And the thing of it is, is their top three receivers from 2018 are gone. So Costello is going to have to be finding new targets. And I think early in the season, he's got the potential to struggle. Northwestern was one of the best road teams in football last season. Pat Fitzgerald and them went 5-0 and on the road. Though Stanford's got the advantage at quarterback here, 
to me, there's just too many questions offensively and defensively for me to swallow nearly seven points against a team like Northwestern that's tested on the road. So I'm taking Northwestern plus six and a half. Final bet of the weekend, South Carolina, North Carolina. This game's being played in Charlotte, neutral field. Opened up back in July, South Carolina minus seven and a half. Current line is sitting at South Carolina minus ten and a half. North Carolina is going to look vastly different this year. Got a new head coach in Mac Brown, new offensive coordinator in Phil Longo. And for the first time in North Carolina history, they got a true freshman starting at quarterback in Sam Howell. Howell was highly recruited coming out of high school. He was actually likely to end up at Florida State had Jimbo Fisher not left. Now, last year, South Carolina was decimated by injuries. They had a pretty disappointing 2018. They returned seven starters, including quarterback Jake Bentley. He'll have one of his better wide right receivers back from last season in Brian Edwards, but primary target Debo Samuel has moved on to the NFL. This game was a little bit harder to handicap for me. I'll be honest for you, I don't love this pick. But I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to back North Carolina plus 10 and a half. And here's why. I know that most people are going to back the SEC team against a, a middling ACC school. However, I think South Carolina kind of enters this game at a disadvantage in terms of preparing for the North Carolina offense. They have no tape on this true freshman except from his high school days, and we all know the high school and collegiate level is completely different. Now, Howell set all kinds of high records last year in high school. I know that really doesn't matter, but this kid is coming in to, to North Carolina with a shitload of hype. Now, South Carolina not really knowing how to prepare for him defensively, to me, puts them at a disadvantage. I could miss this by a mile, but... I just think 10.5 points is too much to swallow with, with so many unknowns going into this game. So, taking North Carolina plus 10.5 there. To recap, taking Oregon plus 3.5, Northwestern plus 6.5, North Carolina plus 10.5. If you haven't noticed yet, I love to bet underdogs. Normally in college football, I lean towards the favorites. In the NFL, I, I'm a normally a dog or pass better. But... I really like two of those underdogs this weekend. The North Carolina game, I'm kind of iffy about, but leaning North Carolina plus 10.5. Now, before we go here, I want to talk about one more thing. Los Angeles Lakers, a week or two ago, actually, I think it happened last week, they, they picked up Dwight Howard. Now, I'm not big on reconciliation. I'm not big on it in my personal life, and I, I definitely don't like it in sports. You know, the Lakers and Dwight Howard had a bitter, ugly divorce back in 2012, 2013. As a matter of fact, Dwight Howard's had a fucking divorce, ugly divorce from just about every NBA franchise that he's been a part of. Ugly divorce in Orlando. Ugly in Los Angeles. Ugly in Houston. Ugly in Atlanta. Hell, in Atlanta, they threw a fucking party in the locker room when they got rid of him. Thought he was going to revive his career in Charlotte under Steve Clifford, who helped him out in Orlando. That didn't happen. Last year in Washington, he played nine games. Dwight Howard shows flashes of brilliance sometimes. At one point in Orlando, he was the most dominant player in the league, hands down. I mean, the guy was a double-double machine. This was before the league was three-point heavy. Stan Van Gundy and the Magic really invented the blueprint for what the Golden State Warriors took and turned into a dynasty. Stan Van Gundy had Dwight Howard and the Magic playing inside out back in 08 and 09. Dwight Howard down low, four shooters around him. And nobody in the league could stop him. You know, that finals against the Lakers, I think if Courtney Lee makes that layup, I believe it was in game one in Staples Center, Courtney Lee makes that layup, that's a completely different series. I also think if they don't put Jameer Nelson back in for Ray for Austin, it's a completely different series, but I, I digress. Nobody cares about that now. It, it, just, it was an interesting signing to me for the Lakers. You had Joakim Noah out there. What the Lakers are looking for since Boogie went down is somebody to, to, to guard the rim, grab rebounds. That's all they need. That's all Joakim Noah has ever done. Joakim Noah has never been a locker room cancer, been a great teammate, 
you pass up on him for Dwight Howard. One of the things that Dwight Howard had a problem with when he was in L.A. the first time was he thought Kobe Bryant was too hard on him. Kobe Bryant took the game too seriously. Now, you want to reference Doug Gottlieb's tweets about millennials from earlier? Dwight Howard's the primary fucking example of what he was talking about. I don't think this is going to work for the Lakers. LeBron James is the exact same as Kobe Bryant in terms of that alpha mentality, that win and nothing else matters. Dwight Howard does not have that gene. He doesn't have it. I don't understand why... To me, the Lakers had a successful offseason. You picked up Anthony Davis. You signed Boogie from Golden State. We're going to get to that in just a second. And the Lakers are perennial favorites to go to the NBA Finals this year. Why would you want to disrupt that with a proven locker room cancer in Dwight Howard? Now, I'm not a Lakers fan. I'm a Pelicans fan, so doesn't bother me at all. I'm interested to see how it works out. Same with Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis is not a leader. I'm interested to see how him and LeBron mesh together. It's going to be an interesting, interesting season in Los Angeles. Before we, I want to talk about Boogie Cousins real quick. I saw a report today that Boogie Cousins has a warrant for his arrest for domestic violence. It doesn't really shock me. TMZ released an audio tape of it. He made a threat to his baby mama. I'm going to make sure I put a bullet in your fucking head because she wouldn't let his son go to his wedding. Now, the reason I bring this up, one, is because this is typical Boogie Cousins, but two, has there been a fall from grace story in the NBA in the past five to six years other than Boogie Cousins? You talk about a guy who in January 2018 had the world at his fingertips. Playing in New Orleans, him and Anthony Davis are finally starting to gel together. Pelicans are in the playoff chase. He goes down with a torn Achilles. Pelicans offer him two years, $40 million, $20 million a year. He thinks he's going to get a Supermax in the offseason. Turns it down. Free agency comes that July. No suitors. Nobody wants Boogie at least for the price tag he's asking. He goes back to the Pelicans. They're no longer interested. I think that's what signed, sealed, and delivered Anthony Davis out of New Orleans. At the time, I was pissed off about it. Now, it worked out better for us. Anyway, back to Boogie. So Boogie comes back in January of this year, what many feel were too soon from an Achilles tear. Has a decent regular season in Golden State. Hurts his leg again in the playoffs. Comes back for the finals. He's a shell of his former self. Really wanted a big contract coming into the offseason. Once again, no suitors. He signs for barely any money with the Lakers. And then a couple of weeks ago, he tears his fucking ACL. I feel bad for DeMarcus Cousins. I really do. He's from my hometown. I know some people who know him. The guy you see on the court is not the guy you see off the court. And to me, it's just interesting. A guy that was looking down the barrel of a max contract last year is now looking down the barrel at the end of his NBA career. I mean, does anybody really think that DeMarcus Cousins can come back from a third leg injury in 18 months and play high-level NBA basketball? I don't. I don't. So, anyway, going to be an interesting NBA season. We'll be covering it here on the podcast. I'm out of here, guys. Uh, I'll be back for you Tuesday. Uh, We'll look back at the weekend, check out how we did on our college football bets, talk about the uh, upcoming week. I'll see you then.